Having had a passion for environmental stewardship and a masochistic personality that enjoys difficult and dirty outdoor work, I began volunteering with the North Branchers on the Cook County Forest Preserves just as we were emerging from the pandemic. Because the volunteer opportunities were in the city, I expected to show up and pick up litter, pull dandelions, in a Kentucky bluegrass park with evenly spaced and neatly manicured trees. But instead, I was greeted by a haven of a native oak savanna ecosystem, a four-foot-tall pile burn, and a passionate team of volunteer site stewards who were handing me a saw and a picture of buckthorn. But the mosaic of feelings elicited by participating in prescribed burns and pile burns is so indescribable, especially when you know that you're a helping hand in an intergenerational, multi-decade project to save that last one one-hundredth percent of a remainder of Chicago's ecological history. I was bitten by the bug quickly and spent every second that I had outside of work and school volunteering to help with burns and fuels management efforts. These experiences helped me reckon with the fearful paradigm that I had with fire after a childhood of being unable to cope with seeing the environment that raised me reduced to charred alien landscapes. Turns out that fire is complex. It's a tool, and it can literally be used to fight the same fires that threaten my hometown. Long before I knew about the dramatic stories of adversity faced by characters like Dwight Perkins or Stephen Packard that we talked about in previous episodes, I would chat to pass the time at work as a newcomer with the other site stewards, and naturally I inquired about the history of the site and the goals for management. Older folks that had been on the projects forever tensed up a little bit when discussing the management of the sites. Too many politics and moving parts to get into for a casual conversation over a water break which is how I ended up in John and Marion's native garden on a summer evening, prying about the management history of the project site. They were recovering beautifully. Ours happened to be in the middle. There was restoration to the north of us and to the south of us. This is the one that was the connector. We decided to connect it. Yeah. No, the the sites that were being worked on were, were good sites. So you guys were finally seeing progress, and things were moving along swimmingly, and yes. then all of a sudden, there's, yeah. Okay, so you're, you're running into a misunderstanding with the community that some of the efforts, because they don't understand what the native site is supposed to look like, right? what you're doing looks destructive to them. Correct. Okay. Correct. And almost 30 years of restoration up to that point, almost 30 years, was shot down. So was there progress that was lost in the time? Oh, absolutely. Almost 30 years. Big time. Every site that had uh, restoration going on it, you realize that the little buckthorn now were 10 years in growth. Mm. So they had to almost go back to uh, doing what they uh, did before. After Perkins' fight with the courts to establish the preserve, Packard's perseverance through the discouragement of academic conservation establishment, and the North Branch's years of toil of the removal of invasives and reintroduction of natives with no playbook, a new battle was brewing with a new enemy that was making themselves known. Unsurprisingly, the settler paradigm that I had grown up with, this mindset that fire was a solely destructive force, was dominant in the communities surrounding the North Branch's efforts. But it was bigger than just fire. It was the idea that people would do anything to alter the landscape that they perceived as wild. But the problem happened, and this was, I think, in the 80s. There is a area in Chicago that's actually in the preserves. It's uh, Sauganash. And there are some people that actually live in the woods. They live in an area that their homes were grandfathered in, in a space that is technically forest preserves. And they saw that it was being opened up where other people could see where they lived. And, you know, then they started to raise a stink about what was happening. They started to claim we were turning everything into prairie, cutting down all the trees. As North Branchers reckoned with the conservationist myth of untouched wild nature by making more progress on their restoration efforts, they were becoming increasingly visible to neighbors who were not privy to the scientific shifts and didn't particularly care to be enlightened. Like John had expressed to me from his own personal experience in the last episode, there was this widespread sense that if the woodlands were thick and green, then nature was healthy. In his blog, Woods and Prairie, Packard recalls that, quote, on a superficial level, we looked very much like the evil that Smokey Bear warned us about, unquote. 
See, the more this group compiled lists of missing savanna species, it was impossible to look around and not see the effects of the missing element of fire. The individuals all over the remnants were gossiping about the story on the landscape. They just had to learn the language first. For instance, the oldest oaks found on the preserves are thick wonders, with branches reaching far out to the sides in all directions, sporting branch scars that indicate even lower levels of foliage in the recent past. Around them, dense single-generation stands of skinny oaks, desperately growing up rather than out to compete with their neighbors for sunlight. If we learn to speak the language of the landscape, the conversation between these different species tells us a story of a sudden suppression of fire in an area that once was a savanna with just a few oaks growing leisurely without contest. Abruptly, the absence of fire let the offspring that would have been cold by regular blazes to shoot up at the same time, fighting like siblings in formerly grass-covered areas, unable to stretch out like the generations of oaks before. This competition is, of course, made even more volatile by the encroachment of the established arch nemesis, Buckthorn, an expert in expanding territory rapidly and shading out the competition. These clues led early ecologists and amateur stewards associated with Packard's North Branch movement to devise a plan to expand their efforts from the existing prairie and restoration on clear land. They wanted to remove trees, not only the invasive ones, but also some of the native ones too, to reestablish the savanna and prairie habitat. They brought in some of the same tools that the conservation paradigm sought to keep out. Chainsaws, herbicide, and fire. Counterintuitively to dominant ideas of the time, this targeted disturbance of the ecosystem allowed space and resources for prairie grasses to make a comeback in a big way. Packard's affiliation of volunteers agreed to take on the restoration of several remnant areas around the north branch of the Chicago River with the aim to experiment with thinning and prescribed burning. The methods developed by early ecologists and employed by the volunteer site stewards looked like pure habitat destruction to many of the folks neighboring the preserved land. In the same blog post mentioned earlier, Packard recalls an ever-expanding list of neighbors who were unhappy with the changes being made to those thick green woodlands that they had always known. In his words... This list of disgruntled neighbors included, but was not limited to, mountain bike and horseback riders who had been used to making and using trails that cut through rare species habitats, old-time forest preserve staff, some of whom were protecting corruptions of various kinds and some of whom didn't like outsiders intruding on their turf, various other officials who profited from the old patronage system who worried that the volunteers were probably reformer types and gaining influence, Bird watchers who noticed that ecological restoration was sometimes destructive of bird habitat, and supposed animal rights activists who opposed deer control in forest preserves. And the deer lovers will certainly come back to that, but I want to focus on this most vocal group that was made up of those who lived in the neighborhoods closest to the forest preserves. They had largely felt a sense of unfounded personal ownership over the area. The dense forests had hidden their properties, offered a space to dump landscape waste, and provided this mythical sense of wilderness that allowed them to feel apart from the intensive development of the Chicagoland region. And they did not want to share. We had to have the county police out. And they would take the police ribbons, the ribbon off a great big area, our work area, that was to keep what we call the antis, the people that were against us, away because they were taking pictures of kids that were helping us, teenagers, high school, even younger if they had their parents with them, and they were putting them in their um, publications. And that's when the superintendent called them into the office. New superintendent. He called them into the office. They showed them all their pictures. They told them all their stories. And when they got finished, he says, I want to tell you something. He says, I don't ever want to see you people again. Note that all of the people that I interviewed recalled that many of these kids being brought on restoration engagement field trips were from underserved schools in Chicago proper. They were largely black and brown, while the incredibly segregated suburbs surrounding the North Branch preserve areas, especially at this time, were overwhelmingly white and generally much wealthier. But anyways, this interaction with the superintendent would not sway the antis. We had a situation where, over here in Miami, the uh, steward. We have these big brush piles, you've seen them, where 
The steward doesn't leave until the pile is fully covered with ash. So he was down loading his tools for the day in his truck. He had left the site and he heard the fire trucks. So he hustled back to the, um, the brush pile. There were some of the aunties that opened up the brush pile to get the fire going again. Then he called the fire department. To make them look bad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, purposely. Huh. And there was one other down by Saganash. Somebody started a fire in the preserves and the lady called it in. Well, she was an auntie. How did she know that uh, that fire was over there? She lives a couple blocks away or whatever it was. Did she set it? Did somebody she knows set it? You know, those are ooh questions. But it is confusing because it sounds like these are the kind of people who are so desperate to keep the forest the way that it is that they're willing to risk its future, both in like an immediate sense and that they're willing to start fires in that way, but then also risk its health over the long term too. Exactly. Right. right. Because My they don't they don't at that time they they didn't understand restoration. And they resented And they didn't want to understand it. No, you're right. They chose not to. They didn't want to be educated. And they just wanted what they wanted for their own neighborhood. It was getting late and I had to head back to the city, but John agreed to take me out on a walk through Linnea Woods and chat about the stewardship of the site the next day. When we finally met up on the walk, I had been working at Labaw Woods brush cutting and pulling invasives all morning, and I got to chatting with the other volunteers about the antis since it had been on my mind. Something about Bunker Hill? So I decided to ask John about it on our walk. I am curious though, today some of the folks were talking about something. Oh, yeah, like something related to Bunker Hill. Yeah. And like there being that being like sort of a catalyst spot. And I don't know if did you know anyone who was part of the like protesting at Bunker Hill or the stewardship? Oh, I don't, I don't know who was there. I was there when the protesters were there, when the police had to put the tape to keep them outside. Mm -hmm. The antis, that's what we called them. They, what they did is they did a sneak attack on uh, the uh, superintendent at the time and um, the president, president, the county board. And he just got all flummoxed by it. And he, all right, stop all work. And so that went for nine years, I can say. But um, John and Jane Balaban is the name that, uh, they're basically our gurus. Okay. They're, they're two of the original people. And they could give you a whole history of North Branch. But, um, and they'd be certainly willing to sit down and talk to you about it. Um, but that, that's the best I can do on that one. I had been hearing a lot about the Balabans from folks all over the North Branch sites that I had worked on. John agreed to introduce me, and I met them at their home just around the corner from the forest preserves. I asked John and Jane to illuminate the why behind the growing tension with the neighbors in the surrounding areas in the preserves and the volunteer movement. I think it was a sense of ownership that these were their woods, not woods belonging to the people of Cook County. Uh, and so they didn't want anybody deciding what was going to happen to their woods. We talked to, to people over and over again about ecology and, uh, and what would happen. You know, their idea was just leave it alone. We said, you know, that's an option. You can leave it alone, but then these things are going to happen. Blah, 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 blah. And eventually you're going to have nothing. There was a woman who was very much a leader of that community mm -hmm. and she had a history of arguments with the Forest Preserve District and so here you know here's the Forest Preserve District and here are these people who are kind of being empowered by the Forest Preserves to do work so there was that also so she had that tendency already and she was one of the leaders who came out of the meeting that John was talking about where um, he had given them, oh, I think some literature, also a book, um, a Miracle Under the Oak, sort of, and she picked some verbiage out of there and used it to promote these wild s stories about what we were going to do. We're going to come in and cut down the woods so we can build more houses and you 
just... <laughs> Do you remember at that time in the country what maybe some of the attitudes about protecting the environment or what conservation, what the larger cultural notion of conservation was like at that time? Well, I would say some things like fire was not well understood um, as part of restoration or as a natural process. So, so that was already, you know, kind of a stumbling block in terms of uh, getting the story out or, you know, explaining to people. But I think even today it's still not, you know, well understood. Uh, yeah. There's a paper on the uh, redwood forest in California. Right. Uh, and uh, what you need to do in order to to save the redwoods, and the first thing you need to do is go in there with chainsaws right. and cut down a lot of damn trees. Right. Uh, and people just can't wrap their brain around that. Um, and not surprisingly, because that's not what we were taught. Right. Exactly. When we were kids, we were taught that you know you put a fence around it and. Right. And that's it, it'll be fine. And that's really what the Forest Preserve did for 70 years, yep, is right. buy land and put a fence around it, uh, and then watch slowly as it collapsed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would say in general at the time, people thought you could preserve nature by simply purchasing it. Like the sense that if there are green things growing in this area, then like, We've done we've done yeah, a good job. Yeah. Pack it up. Let's head out. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that was something that was really very clear. There was a there was a meeting. Probably a hundred people signed up to talk, uh, and like ninety five of them were pro restoration, and five of them were against it. But it was interesting when you listen to people talk. The people who understood restoration spoke about being inside the forest preserve and seeing what was there, you know, they were, they were in the woods, kind of, and the people who were opposed were outside the forest preserve, looking in and seeing that it was green. And so it was good, you know. Why are these people going in and cutting down that green stuff, you know? Yeah, like if it's alive we shouldn't be killing anything that's alive, like focused on the individual plants more than the community of plants as a whole. Um, yeah, well, I'm not even they, sure that. I, I think, think they didn't see the diversity. They mm. saw something very homogeneous mm. and not the tremendous diversity that you see as you're actually walking through and looking at things and knowing them. And, um, I remember we had one walk we were pulling garlic mustard, oh, yeah, I think, and I ran into uh, an unusual plant, or a bank, he, uh, doesn't have any chlorophyll. And so I said, oh, there's a great plant over here. And one of the people who was opposed to the work was actually on the work day, although not doing a lot of work. Uh, and as she came over to where I was, she walked up and she almost stepped right on the thing. <laughs> that I was pointing out, and she said, where is it? <laughs> it's almost under your feet now. In addition to the daunting task of restoring degraded sites with little to no resources, a limited gene pool, and no real established framework for how a volunteer-run restoration effort would operate, the group was now facing complex threats. While many of the folks within the forest preserve structure were threatened by the reformist attitudes of the volunteers, the cultural context of the community surrounding the preserves existed within informed an agitated response. The volunteers were operating within a brand new field of restoration ecology, a field whose ideas, practices, and values had not been widely disseminated into the broader cultural narratives around land stewardship. They were coming from an entirely different worldview than the surrounding neighbors, and feelings and paradigms are notoriously hard to shift. Who would win over the favor of local decision makers who held the fate of the North Branch Volunteers movement in their hands? So we have this structure in the county where we have the county board of commissioners, and we have the county, the uh, Forest Reserve Board of Commissioners, and they're the same people. Mm -hmm. And so they wear two different hats. Most of those county board people at that time 
could have cared less about the forest preserves. I mean, they just, it was out of the picture. And so when all of a sudden this group of people who had long had connections with the commissioners started raising hell, they, that's who they were going to listen to. And so there was a lot of push, pushback from the county board at that time. Um, we had a few commissioners at that time who were interested and uh, cared about the preserves, but not many. So this so, is a really vocal minority of people. Yeah. Uh, and, well. and when you say minority, I mean, this is minority, minority. Right. You know, when you go to your neighbors and you say that the Forest Preserve is going to cut down all the trees around our houses and turn it into prairie. And you're a leader already. Um, you're certainly going to be upset by that. You don't know what's going on. You don't want the trees to cut down. The fact that that's not going to happen is irrelevant, you know. This uproar was um, effective, was they had a Sun-Times reporter who was on their side and who got a lot of my mileage out of it. He wrote a lot of really just dopey columns. So with the Bunker Hill um, protests that happened, there was like, you know, this was not like a board, a lot of this I'm assuming is going down in discussions with, you know, county commissioners and stuff like that, but there is this protest that happened, I guess. What did that look like? Like, what was happening? <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> it was, um, there were just, there were really nasty things said about volunteers. So these people spoke up, they got, that got the commissioner's ears, and that's when everything was stopped at the, for a short period restoration everywhere in Cook County Forest Reserves was stopped. And then it was narrowed down to just the four or five sites, including Miami, um, in this area where we couldn't do anything for about 12 years. These people who had purported to be concerned about the well-being of these areas were so concerned about maintaining their own idea of how these ecosystems should look and function that they missed the opportunity to connect with the North Branch movement and connect with the process of renewing the area so that it could operate as a diverse and dynamic ecosystem that could sustain itself long past their own enjoyment of the sites. These sites are a public good for all of the people of Chicago. But they felt so threatened by the paradigm shift offered by the volunteer movement that they jeopardized not only the current progress made by the group, but the momentum, community, and connection of the North Branchers moving forward. But over nearly a decade of shutdown, the movement held strong and continued to advocate for the importance of restoration, sharing not only the science, but honing their message, vision, and values to engage the surrounding community more effectively and meet them where they were at, in terms of understanding the science behind the process. But the exciting thing is when Bobby Steele, yeah, commissioner, uh, when she became the president and lifted the moratorium, we immediately had some. So no work was done at Bunker Hill for like twelve years. Uh, when she lifted the moratorium, we had a couple of big work days where we were cutting all the twelve foot tall buckthorn and ash now that had moved in and pull them out, and two years later, it looked just like it had looked 12 years earlier. Mm -hmm. It just so snapped very, right back. Very resilient. Once you yep. get it back in good shape, it's, it takes a lot to destroy it again. Um, as John said, it was a learning experience. In our naivete, we got together you know, early on, our little group, and we're talking about, well, what do we do? Well, all we have to do is we have to go down to the commissioners and explain the science behind it. No, <laughs> that is definitely not the, I mean, you do that too, but um, we thought that's all you had to do. Of course you don't. Right. Sometimes humans um, are more swayed by an emotional argument <laughs> yes. oftentimes. Right. So so it was a learning experience. We, we learned, I think, that we were not necessarily using the right language when we talk to people who, who didn't understand what we were doing. So we talk about, you know, uh, buckthorn, this terrible tree, you know. And to some people that's, what? Mm -hmm. 
it's not, it's not bad. And in reality, it's not. It's just we learn to say it's a plant out of place, which is more appropriate and more accurate. Totally. Anyway, so it was, it was definitely, I would say, a learning t time for us. You know, it just was just one small blip. It, it helped us understand that we needed to be more proactive with the commissioners, which was an important lesson for us to learn. Right. These volunteers had had no formal training, but in all reality, there was no playbook from which to train from yet. As history played out, it would become clear that the volunteers of Cook County Forest Preserve were conducting a prominent experiment that was actively shaping the field of restoration ecology. What they lacked in training, they made up for with passion for learning, observing, breaking down daunting goals into actionable plans and interfacing with the community. Dr. Natalie Bumpvina, who'd helped me piece together an understanding of the challenging start to the Cook County Forest Preserves, wrote of these early years in the volunteer movement in a published historical case study, saying, quote, Volunteer expertise in ecological restoration exceeded that of most Forest Preserve District employees who were bound by institutional constraints, including the effects of political corruption and the district's prevailing view that only forestation fulfilled its legal mandate. Volunteer stewards built up and wielded their expert credibility to change, over several decades, the district's natural resources strategies. In the process, volunteers brought lasting change to the inner workings of this government agency. The volunteer movement has fought hard to exist and maintain its existence, and it has only continued to grow in number of volunteers and sites while challenging these outdated ideas about conservation and the broader culture around it. In the next episode, we'll delve into how the organization is facing new challenges with new faces and energy to bring the vision of the emerald necklace around Chicago's neck that Perkins had had so long ago into the future. This podcast is a production of The Blaze Project that's written, researched, and produced by me, Lou Bean, with music by Chicago-based musician Hauntus. Thank you so much to John and Mary and Thill, and John and Jane Balban for their time in interviewing for this episode, as well as Dr. Donnelly Bumpvina for providing research sources for this episode.